This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. We have to make choices, sometimes tragic choices, between values. There's a clash between liberty and equality, for example. If people are free to deploy the talents they have to pursue any profession they wish, any life they wish, then some inequality is inevitable. So we have to balance one value against another. That, in any case, is how many philosophers think about values. But Ronald Dworkin, one of the most significant political and legal theorists of the past half century, believes that's quite the wrong account. Values do not clash. There's a unity to value. Ronald Dworkin, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you. The topic we're going to focus on is the unity of value. What is that? (laughs) Well, it's several things. It's mainly the position that rejects a very popular idea now, popular in political rhetoric, popular in academic philosophy, which is called pluralism. Pluralism, again, there are many different kinds of it, but the pluralism that I worry about is the pluralism that says... Values are not consistent with one another. You have to make your choices. You can't act through your life or in politics so that you have nothing to regret. Because, for example, if you establish care about liberty, you can't also have equality. If you care about equality, you can't have liberty because you only get equality by stopping people from doing what they want. Well, that's a view particularly associated with Isaiah Berlin, who I think quoted that line that freedom for the pike is death for the minnows. The idea that you could have freedom for the pike and the minnows and they would live happily and have a degree of equality is just implausible. Yes, it's implausible depending upon what you take liberty and equality to be. Now, Isaiah Berlin, if you look carefully at what he means by these ideas, he means by equality, everybody having the same thing, even though some people work, others don't, some invest, others consume. That's not an attractive ideal. What does he mean by liberty? He means people being free to do whatever they might want to do, rape people, kidnap people's children. Now, if you accept either of these definitions, then of course liberty and equality are going to conflict. But these are silly definitions. We ought to pursue the idea of getting working ideals framed in terms of our political values by identifying things as values only when we think that they name things we should pursue when they name things that if we don't abide by them, we've done something wrong. It's not wrong that people have more if they work than if they don't. It's not wrong to punish people who want to kidnap my grandchildren. So are you saying that just as a strategic approach, whenever there's a conflict, we should try to find a resolution? Or are you saying... There is a right answer in this case about the correct definition of liberty, the correct definition of equality. No, I'm saying there is a right answer about the correct definition. I know that sounds a bit arrogant. Let me explain. We share concepts. We talk about justice, injustice, liberty, equality, goodness, badness. Now, the right conception of these has to take the form of a theory. You can't answer the question, what is justice, by looking in the dictionary. You have to answer it by looking at the social function of the idea of justice. We use it to justify behavior. We use it to criticize other people's behavior. We say, this is unjust, so it has to be stopped. We need to think of definitions or conceptions, we might say, of these virtues which justify what we do in their name. If we think that something that's unjust should be stopped, we need a definition of justice that tells us why it should be stopped. If we think liberty is a value worth pursuing, we need an account of what liberty is that justifies us in saying government should protect liberty. 
And yet different societies, different countries find different solutions to the question of what justice is or what the appropriate limits of liberty should be. People trying to justify torture in certain circumstances, different countries find different solutions. Does that mean that's just right for them, that they do it differently from us? Or are the countries that do it differently from us getting it wrong? You're emphasising what people and cultures disagree about. But it's very interesting what they agree about in your formulation. And what they agree about is that there's a right answer. They don't say torture is all right for us but not for them. They say torture is permissible in this kind of a circumstance. So in order to understand what's going on in the use of this language, we have to make sense of that part of what people say, that they in fact agree. Now, philosophers come along and they say, because they disagree, there's no right answer. Well, the position that there's no right answer is just another view in the field. If I say there's no right answer to the question of whether torture is permissible or not, I'm making a moral statement. And there is no way to reclassify that as something else. I'm disagreeing with the person who says it is forbidden. I'm taking a different moral position. So if I say there's no right answer to a moral question, I'm contradicting myself because I'm trying to offer one. Now, what counts as the right answer? Well, the only way to defend a claim that I've got the right answer is for me to make an argument. And of course that argument, every bit of it, will be rejected by people who disagree with the conclusion. In the end, it's a question of conviction. If I say this is the right answer, I have to think after responsible thought, after subjecting what are the arguments I've made to a, a certain kind of responsible criticism, the conviction that it's right has to survive for me. It doesn't mean that because I have that conviction, I'm right. What it means is that the only way that I can judge whether there's a right answer and what the right answer is, is to go through a process of thinking about the matter and coming to a conclusion. You can't say that because nobody can prove he's right to the satisfaction of everybody else, it follows that no one is right. That's a logical fallacy. Now, I know interpretation plays a significant role in your approach to value. Could you just flesh that out a bit? It's not obvious why interpretation is involved at all here. You have to start with some account of what interpretation is. To put it in a very crude and summary way, we interpret something when we make the best of it. We interpret Shakespeare's plays not by trying to find our way into the mind of a 16th century playwright. That's not possible. We interpret it by taking the words of the play and saying, how can these words be most illuminating? And different directors, different actors speak the lines differently for that reason. Now, when you come to ideas, the idea of liberty, justice, equality, we have to make the best of them, the best of the practice we have in the following way. These ideas license action. We use them to disagree about what kind of action is appropriate and what kind of circumstances. To interpret them is to try and find a conception, an understanding of what each is, which best justifies the action that we take these terms to license. That's what I mean by interpretation. We share the concept, but we interpret it differently. You need an account of what moral reasoning is like, and I think the best account is given by the fact that we try and find the best justification we can of the practice that we share 
when we use these terms. Does that mean that if you have intelligent, reasonable people, you're going to move towards a consensus about the interpretation of a concept like liberty? I doubt it. Certainly intelligence on its own is important because it means that inconsistencies will be recognized by intelligent people who are talking in good faith. Here we come to pluralism again, because if people think that liberty and equality conflict with one another, you might point out to them occasions in which they have to decide. And it may turn out that their opinions, for example, about how terrorist suspects should be treated, don't really match their opinions about how they should be treated if accused of a crime. And through examples of that, you might call these rather grand, the Socratic examples, you might get intelligent people to come to see that a new interpretation is what's required. But there's no guarantee. I think the idea that we'll come to consensus is very attractive to philosophers. It's nourished this idea by, I think, an unfortunate tradition in political and moral philosophy, which says we ought to have a political system that enjoys the consent of the governed. But, of course, there can't be any political system that enjoys the full consent of all the governed. So we get metaphors. We say, well, oh, well, we mean what they would agree to under certain very bizarre circumstances or what their ancestors agreed to in the never-never land of great antiquity or something of that sort. We get into a lot of trouble. No, we don't need the consent of the governed. Consensus is not indispensable. It's in many ways desirable. But consensus around the wrong idea would be worthless. From an individual point of view, is there anything that follows from the unity of value about how we should live? First, it's important to just notice what doesn't follow from the unity of values, namely indolence, laziness, and excuse. The idea of pluralism functions very often as an excuse. You can't have both liberty and equality. I like liberty for my part, therefore I'm against taxation on people as rich as I am. That kind of a dodge is not on. I think you have to begin by thinking there is a way people should live. It isn't that, oh, as the existentialist said, oh, I'll just throw a dot and then commit myself enthusiastically to whatever the dot hits. No, we have to think that we've got a life, we have a responsibility to make something of it. Part of that responsibility is thinking what life is appropriate. And I believe that leading your life with a certain kind of dignity, with authenticity, is crucial. That doesn't settle the question of whether you should become a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief. It just says it's indispensable that you behave with a certain kind of authenticity. Thinking two things. First, that your life is valuable. What you do with your life is important. Then the next question would be, if my life has a certain significance, objective significance, from, as it were, the standpoint of the universe, what follows about how you treat other people? Now, when this is done, I've made an argument, and you could make one too, and everybody can. I've made an argument that sets out what, for me, is integrity. I think it's the right answer to these cosmic questions. I know I can't prove it, but what I can do is to live my life with the kind of integrity that flows from my conception of what a responsible life is like. That's quite different from one kind of liberalism which says that what we should do is give people space to make decisions about their life, to make their own mistakes, just experiment with a life. You seem to be saying, no, no, there is a right answer and you should strive to find it. Yeah. I don't 
think that's at all inconsistent. The responsibility for deciding how to live belongs to the person whose life it is. When we say liberalism requires that people be free, that's not because liberalism supposes all lives are equally good or there's no right answer to how to live. That's a rap that liberalism has had over many centuries, I'm afraid. No, it's because liberalism is committed to a certain view about the right way to live. The right way to live is taking responsibility for your own life. That is not universally granted. I mean, if you go to various places in the Middle East, you will find that that is not thought to be an essential idea of living well. You've mentioned existentialism, and there's a famous example that Jean-Paul Sartre uses of a, a student who came to him asking, during wartime, should I join the Free French and fight for the liberation of my country, or should I stay behind with my mother who's sick and might die without me? That seems to be a genuine moral dilemma. And Sartre's response was, you should just choose. There's no right answer. You should just choose what to do. But does it follow from your theory that there is a right answer there? Yes. I remember someone once saying to me, I overheard a conversation in a train between two women, one of whom was very distressed, and the other one said to her, be philosophical, don't think about it. Well, that's Sartre's answer. Somebody says, look, I'm in agony about this. And Sartre says, why are you in agony? All you do is flip a coin. All you do is decide. Now, that is profoundly to misunderstand the human situation. To feel an agony is right. If you accept what I think is a basic postulate of ethics, which is it's important how I live, then the question is scorchingly important and can't be evaded. What's the right answer? The first thing to say is there is one. You can't just spin out a right answer. You have to think about, in this case, the idea of filial loyalty, the idea of patriotism. You have to try and work out, in my view, some understanding of these that carried to a certain degree of interpretation will tell you what's the right thing to do. Responsibility means taking the situation seriously, thinking along these lines, not having an existentialist cop-out in your pocket. Ronald Dawkin, thank you very much. Thank you, I've enjoyed it. There's now a Philosophy Bites book published by Oxford University Press. For more information, go to www.philosophybites.com. For more information about the Institute, go to www.philosophy.sas.ac.uk. Mm-hmm.